as we continue in worship, knowing that we are remembering, we are celebrating, we are honoring those who have gone before us to glory this morning. Um, we're going to, we'll have a moment where we'll be able to do that. You're going to, we're going to hear some music. We're going to, um, it's, it's going to be a prayer. You'll see names and faces on the screen. And if someone, after I, I'm going to read this prayer, if someone has touched your life, someone in this communion of saints has impacted your life in some way, I do invite you when you see them, I invite you to stand or to raise your hand if you are not able to stand. Stand in body or in spirit. Raise a hand or stand in recognition for the impact that these folks have had on your life and that impact that continues, the ripple effect of that, the love that they have shared with you that continues flowing on through you to other people. And this is the way that we do continue that communion of saints. We become it's that thin space where we get to be one with those who have gone before. And so this is a prayer by the Reverend Jan Richardson for those who walked with us. For those who walked with us, this is a prayer. For those who have gone ahead, this is a blessing. For those who touched and tended us, who lingered with us while they lived, this is a thanksgiving. For those who journey still with us, in the shadows of awareness, in the crevices of memory, in the landscape of our dreams, this is a benediction.
Sono, sono, sogno all'orizzonte, mancano le parole. Sì, lo so che non c'è luce in una stanza quando manca il sole. Se non ci sei tu con me, con me, su le finestre, mostra a tutti.
Amen. <laughs> oh. Oh, gracious God. Astonish us this morning. Open our hearts to receive whatever message it is that you have for us. May the meditations of my own heart be found faithful. Amen. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The message paraphrase of that says, do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blaze the way, all these veterans cheering us on. It means we'd better get on with it. Start running and never quit and keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race that we are in. Study how he did it. Because he never lost sight of where he was headed, that exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way, cross, shame, whatever, and now he's there. He's there in the place of honor right beside God. And so when you find yourselves flagging in your faith, go over that story again, item by item, that long litany of hostility that he plowed through, and that, that will shoot adrenaline through your veins. Drive on, is what my friend Tish used to say about these verses. This was her verse, these verses. When she battled ovarian cancer, that was her rallying cry. Drive on this race before you. Let us run with perseverance. Start running and never quit. Hold on to faith with both hands and keep our eyes on Jesus. I don't have a picture of me and Tish together. I wish I did. I can still hear her infectious laugh. I can still see her ginormous smile. She was a character. She was, she was gentle and she was silly and she was passionate and creative and she was fiercely kind. She was great with kids. She loved them. She was a teacher. She had two little boys who were the same age as our oldest son, Ryan. She taught at the Methodist preschool where I rediscovered my faith. And she loved to, if you all, if you remember, if you had preschoolers recently or whatever, she loved to tootie tot. A tootie tot, a tootie tot. A to no? Okay. <laughs> she loved to do that with our youngest daughter. You should, you should Google it. Um, she made the best chicka chicka boom boom tree I'd ever seen. She loved to make books come to life. For her kids and right before her diagnosis she'd become a teacher at one of our elementary schools kind of graduating up with her boys she was one of those people I don't know if you have people in your life who see you who get you she saw me she got me we had the same quirky sense of humor the tootie tot and we each thought the other one was hilarious you need someone in your life who thinks you're hilarious. Once during her cancer treatment, her husband told us she was having a rough time staying positive, which was very unlike her. She just wanted to go home, though. She wanted to go home with her boys and just hang out with them. She'd had surgery. And you know, if you've had surgery, 
they wouldn't release her until everything started moving again. <laughs> and it was drizzling that night that he called and told us this. And I packed up my kids and I left the house and it was thundering, um, it was drizzling when I left the house. It was thundering by the time that I'd gone to several stores and found what I was looking for that I wanted to give her. And I remember the kids crying in the car on I-4 on the way to the hospital, because at this point it's lightning and I am gripping the steering wheel, you know, for dear life. And when we made it to the hospital, there was some guy on the elevator and he saw what I was carrying and he says, I don't even want to know what kind of surgery that person had. When I, made it, when I made it upstairs and I got off the elevator, I couldn't go see her because I had the kids with me and because her immune system had bottomed out and her husband burst into laughter when he saw me. I gave her the, my gift that I was looking for, that I went all over town looking for. It was a dozen whoopee cushions in a vase. <laughs> she absolutely loved it. She brought it up so many times. What a character I was, right? Tish fought a good fight with faith and a great sense of humor. She had wigs for each day of the week in all different styles and colors so her husband wouldn't know which wife he was coming home to. She wore the silliest cartoon slippers with satin pajamas. And in the spring, our church always made hundreds of cookies for Teacher Appreciation Week, and I was on that team that bagged those cookies up to send them out, and I made a little bag for her so she wouldn't miss out, and I brought them to her. And I could tell that something had shifted in her spirit when she opened the door, and I sat with her while she cried. And she hugged me for a long time before I left, and a few days later, she was gone. And I remember her every April, and I thank God that I got to be a part of her life. The thing about Tish is that even though she had that one night where she got, where she was down, right, her faith was so strong. She taught me how to persevere. And I don't think she ever realized what an impact she made on my life. She wasn't even one of my besties, right? She wasn't the first person I called when I had a bad day or when I got great news. I didn't go on vacation with her. We didn't plan joint birthday parties with our kids. Do you know how Jesus had that inner circle of his three friends, um, Peter, James, and John? And then he had his, his, you know, the other 12, the rest of the 12. And then he had those outliers, the outer bands, right? The Marthas and the Nicodemuses, Nicodemi. Thank you. <laughs> I'll take it. It was gratuitous, but I'll still take it. Tish was out there in that outer band of friends for me, and yet she was still so special to me. And I don't know if you have folks in your life that are like that. They're not like the closest people to you, but the light that they shine has a special kind of brilliance and a unique kind of warmth. It draws you to them. That was Tish. And I don't think she knew that. I don't think I ever told her that. And she wasn't just that for me, but I think she was like that for a lot of people because the day of her funeral, there was standing room only. And I remember thinking that I wish she were there so that I could say, oh my gosh, Tish, I can't believe all these people showed up for you. Sometimes we don't see the difference that we make in the lives that we touch, which is all the more reason that we should live as if our relationships and the encounters that we have with each other, that they matter, because they do. Sometimes they have eternal repercussions, that ripple effect, and we may never know. Like I said, I don't have a picture of the two of us together, but I carry her in my heart. She is a part of my great cloud of witnesses, the beautiful communion of saints. And I can still hear her saying, drive on. And I believe that's what the author of Hebrews wants us to hear and wants us to take to heart as well. Because right before these verses in, in chapter 12, in, verse, in chapter 11, it's filled with snapshots of saints, right? They are named and unnamed. They are celebrating and they are suffering. They are joy-filled and they are sorrowful. Some of their stories ended well, and some of them didn't. 
What they all had in common is that thing that I saw shimmering through Tish's life, a sustaining and a persevering faith. Running the race, not giving up, eyes on Jesus, driving on faith. Faith that says, even though it seems like nothing makes sense and nothing seems fair, all is not lost, do not lose heart. We will see each other again and your joy will be complete. That kind of faith. Faith that shines when we cannot see. Faith that guides us on. Faith that leads us home. Faith that connects us in ways we can only imagine in the communion of saints. And the race that we run is the life that we live while we're here, right? And even though we all have a race, it's different for each one of us. There are all sorts of things that come into play to make that true. We have to figure out what's within our control, what's not, or what we wrestle God for control over, what we give to God, take back, give to God, that thing. What do we need to hold on to and what should we let go of? Let us throw off everything that hinders us, the author of Hebrews says. Let us throw off everything that hinders us. And if you've ever run a race, if you ever run a, a marathon or a half marathon, a lot of times they start when it's still dark out. You might wear a, a light jacket or sweatpants. When the sun comes out and the day warms up, the course gets littered with clothing that folks peel off as they run, right? And there are volunteers that collect that clothing and they either discard or donate them afterwards. And it's the same with the race before us, right? The race that we run with our lives. We have to decide who and what helps or harms us as we run, and we cull and we cultivate as we go through our lives. During Disney races, they invite you to write your name on your bib or on uh, your shirt or on some visible part of your body, your arms or your legs, and cast members volunteer to line the race route and cheer for you by name. And that's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome when the race is going well, and it's especially awesome when the race is not going well for people to be cheering you by name. You might remember I told you about the ultra marathoner, uh, the ultra marathon angel, who finished the Disney half marathon to get his qualifying time, and then he came back to run with and cheer on his wife, who happened to be, I happened to be running with her. So he's probably the main reason I ended up finishing that particular race. And that's exactly what Jesus does for us as the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, the one who brings us to completion. As the word pioneer has a, a rich meaning as the one who actually sets the course, who knows it best. And in Greek, it's a lot like the team captain, the one who finishes the race first and then waits for the rest of the team, waits at the finish line to encourage and to celebrate the rest of the team as they come through. And I can only imagine Jesus cheering us on by name at the finish line, surrounded by that great cloud of witnesses, not just folks that we knew and loved, but the folks who knew and loved them, right? Same as my race angel who came back for his wife, but I got to be included in that. Like all these picture frames, right, up here on this table, all these faces, all these names, these and so many more, the ones that we carry in our hearts that we don't have pictures for. These are just, these here are, are just from a past year for our church family, for services that we've held and hands and hearts that we've held. They're like the photographs that we might have on the walls of our home. Names and faces and hearts and lives that impacted and influenced us, that continue to mold us and shape us and redeem us and embrace us. A family photo album starts here but it continues on in that great cloud of witnesses. It goes back years and it goes back generations and families and countries and revolutions and evolutions. And we have been grafted into this incredible family tree, the family of God. Welcomed, invited, and welcomed all. A great cloud of witnesses that we are surrounded by, 
that we are a part of and we will one day get to join in complete glory, in completion. Each of these pictures is like a light that's shown in our lives, right? Shining the way. All of these lives, all of these lights are bright enough on their own, each light. But when we add them together, it's like a string of Christmas lights, right? It stretches out behind us like that never-ending strand of Christmas lights and not the kind that you have to search for the bulb that goes out and the whole light, the whole strand goes. This is the kind that it doesn't matter. It's going to go on. It's going to be lit. It's going to go on forever. Lights that uh, illuminate. Lights that we can trace. Lights that comfort us and encourage us. Lights that give us a glimpse of the kingdom of God. Like when we light our candles on Christmas Eve. One light after another until the whole church is full. And just like Christmas Eve, All Saints Day is one of those really thin spaces. The ancient Celts believed that heaven and earth were only so far apart, about three feet. But then there were times that they got so close, it was almost like you could just pull back a bridal veil, right? And you could get to see you had that faint, this dim light, and now you can see clearly. All of a sudden, you feel like you've got to take your shoes off, and you've got to cover your face, and you've got to whisper because you are standing in the presence of God. You're so aware of it. Surely the presence of the Lord was in this place, right? God, help us to be aware. One of the churches that was briefly our church home, our family's church home, didn't have official members. What they had was you didn't join the church, you became part of a life group. So in a next steps kind of a class, the pastor gave us an empty picture frame and encouraged us to go out and find our people. And what he said was, in six months, if you can't find, if you can't put a picture in this frame of you and friends that you have made here that you would want to display in your home, this might not be the church for you. And we laughed at that because we couldn't imagine we couldn't imagine that happening. We loved this church. It was, so, it was such a great place. But he was right. It wasn't the right church for us. We tried really hard to make friends and to fit in, but they just weren't our people. They were a safe place during a really rough season of our lives. So we got to worship and we learned and we prayed and we healed there. And I'm grateful for that healing space that they gave us. We found our people right away at the next church. And I still have an ongoing text thread with three friends that are there. And the other day I told them, I love you people. I stinking love you people. And one of them responded, that's because we are your people. Yes. Thank you, God. Yes, indeed, you are. You are my people. The three of them are, are part of my great cloud of witnesses here, now, right, this side of heaven. They are in my picture frames, in all of their geeky glory. And I am so grateful. So if I were to hand you a picture frame, would you be able to fill it? Would you be able to find folks that you would want to take a picture with and hang on the walls of your home in this community that we are, have built and we are building together here at Pasadena. What pictures? Can you imagine what pictures you might put in those frames? What pictures would you want to put in those frames? Who are your great cloud of witnesses this side of heaven? Because they're here. They're with you. They're walking beside you. We're all walking each other home. And are there folks who would put you in their frames? I hope so. As we celebrate and we remember the saints that we have known and loved, the saints who have gone to glory ahead of us, 
and who we cannot wait to be reunited with someday. Let us also celebrate and remember those who are still here. Because there are lights shining all around us. If you look to your left, you look to your right, you turn around, spin around, if you 2D taught, you will see them. I wish, I wish I had told Tish then what I know that she knows now. So let this be your invitation to tell someone how much the light that they shine and they share means to you. We are tomorrow's saints. We are a great cloud of witnesses in the making. So let us not grow weary or lose heart. Let us drive on. Amen and amen.